Medistand. Understanding medicine. Professor Azizur Rahman here. I hope you are bearing with me and you are liking my ECG videos and you are learning. And in the last video, we discussed supraventricular tachycardias. And if you remember, there were two main types. One is where the re-entry circuit is within the AV node. We call it AV nodal re-entrant tachycardia. And the other variety is the where there is re-entry, but that involves an anomalous pathway, an accessory pathway, uh, which connects atria and ventricle, or sometimes AV node and ventricles. And these anomalous pathways, they provide a structural basis for the re-entry to develop. And these are collectively called pre-excitation syndrome, and this would result in what is called atrioventricle reciprocating tachycardias. Now, when you see the patient during tachycardia, you will probably not be able to tell if it is AV nodal re-enter tachycardia or is it atrioventricle reciprocating tachycardia. But once patient recovers from the tachycardia phase, then some ECG abnormalities might point toward a pre-existing condition called pre-excitation syndrome. There are multiple types and it is actually not necessary that all these patients would have ECG changes. Typically, these ECG changes are seen only when there is no tachycardia. During tachycardia, these ECG changes are masked. I'll tell you in detail later, but one disclaimer that all these patients do not exhibit ECG changes even when there is no tachycardia. So we are going to cover this topic today. Pre-excitation syndromes. In all of these, there is an anomalous pathway connecting atria and ventricle providing uh, the entry of current into the ventricle prior to the AV nodal uh, current that is called pre-excitation. So it is the depolarization of the ventricle prior to the actual depolarization of the entire. It is a depolarization of the portion of ventricle prior to the depolarization of the entire ventricle. So there are two or three types. Let me explain. First is Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. Now, this is actually the three scientists who describe this condition. Uh, by definition, Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome is a condition where you have some specific ECG abnormalities due to anomalous pathways, these one. And the person also has history of paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. So both are required to fulfill the definition. You need to have some structural basis, ECG abnormalities, and you also need to have history of these tachycardias. Of course, uh, there could be the first attack. So then of, you would label that patient, but typically patient has history of multiple such attacks. In other words, if you just see the ECG abnormality, you might not label it as full-fledged pre-excitation syndrome. You would just label that this patient has got ECG abnormality of pre-excitation syndrome. So there are two types, type A and type B. I guess there is a type C also. In type A, the anomalous pathway, the aberrant pathway is on the left side of the heart. And in type B, the same is on the right side of the heart. And in type C, there is, it is in the middle. Now, these, the location of these anomalous pathways, they would translate into some specific ECG changes. So we can find out actually from ECG, which type is it, is it type A or B, but clinically doesn't really matter whether it is type B or type A, it has the same consequences as long as you can figure out 
that this patient has got Wolf Parkinson White syndrome, your job is done. The other one is called Lown Genong Levine syndrome, and this is again described by three scientists. And in this condition, the pathway is within the AV node, just providing a short shortcut to the ventricles. And I think the ECG abnormality is very simple in this case. I will shortly explain. And the third one is Mahem type of pre-excitation. This is, I believe, the least common. And in this case, there is a normal pathway from the AV node down into the ventricles. And all these, they predispose to re-entry mechanism and atrioventricular reciprocating tachycardia. So what is common between pre-excitation syndrome? That they predispose to SVTs. These patients are typically young patient and they present with ventricular, uh, these tachycardia. And sometimes they may be asymptomatic they may not have, and in fact, in the majority of the cases, they would be asymptomatic. And just you do a routine ECG, like ECG is done prior to a surgery, then some ECG abnormality is detected, and then patient may be diagnosed without having actually history of SVT. So let me explain. I have drawn the pictures to make the concept clear. This is Wolf, Par Wolf Parkinson White syndrome, and you can uh, see that this is the structure of the heart. This is the atrial side. This is the ventricle side. This line indicates that there is uh, there is uh, the electrical current cannot go from the atria to the ventricle except through the AV node. But in Wolf Parkinson White syndrome, there could be this or this anomalous pathway. If this is present, then from current current from atria can leak into the ventricle without having to go through the AV node. Of course, current will later go through the AV node also, but initial part current will leak into the ventricle. And this is uh, the, the either of the two could cause Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. This is Lone Genong Levine syndrome. There is no anomalous pathway here, but there is an anomalous pathway within the AV node. Now, in the AV node, the current will not have to pass through a very uh, special circuit which holds the current. It will have the opportunity of just tricking down in the through this bundle and getting into the ventricle relatively quickly. And then the third one is Mahem type of defect. In this, the anomalous pathway actually is from the AV node down to the ventricle. There is a normal his bundle and bundle branches also, but there is a shortcut to the some part of the ventricle. So in this case, this is a true type of uh, pre-excitation syndrome. You would have some ECG abnormalities when patient is not having tachycardia during tachycardia typically these ecg changes they disappear or they are masked during and when patient is not having tachycardia you can pick up those ecg abnormality and can make a diagnosis in this case the only ecg abnormality is a relatively short pr interval you know this av node is responsible for holding the current in av node so if current just slips down through the AV node, it would result into small PR interval. Otherwise, patient is normal. In this case, PR interval should be normal because this part is not affected. It is only once the current has passed the AV node, it would affect ventricular depolarization. So QRS complexes may have different morphology than normal. But whatever type of defect you may have, whether it is visible on ECG or not, all of them, they predispose to atrioventricular reciprocating tachycardia. So that is the common factor. All of them are collectively called pre-excitation syndromes. What is the clinical importance of pre-excitation syndrome? I think there is dual importance. One is they can cause supraventricular tachycardia. That is a morbid condition. It could be very, very problematic, symptomatic, and sometimes serious. 
but it sometimes can also cause atrial fibrillation or flutter, which of course is potentially serious condition. Then it also depends what age is the patient. If patient is young, he or she may be able to tolerate these SVTs and fibrillations. But if the patient is now a little older, then these can be real problems. So that is, I think, the importance of pre-excitation syndromes. The second one is that if patient is asymptomatic and not having tachycardia, but you happen to see the ECG, it would show the ECG abnormalities. Now, expert would be able to identify the diagnosis of Wolf Parkinson White syndrome, but many would confuse these changes with infarction, with ischemia, hypertrophy, and bundle branch blocks. Now, imagine that means practically every cardiac condition you could confuse pre excitation with any other. ECG abnormality. So very important. So you be vigilant if you see some ECG abnormality when it was not expected, the patient is otherwise healthy, patient is like getting prepared for operation and ECG is done, somebody picks up the ECG abnormality and operation is different. Now I recall many incidences when, when we saw the ECG, we found that this is actually pre excitation syndrome, patient is otherwise fit. Operation was allowed, operation was successful, only we just took some precautions to prevent SVTs. So there is twofold importance, I think, that justifies that you need to know this topic. One, these patients are prone to have SVTs, atrial fibrillation, flutters. Second, these patients, the ECG can be confused with any other, other cardiac condition. Now let's do some exercise. This is the ECG. Let's see if you can figure out like this is limb lead 1, 2, 3, AVR, AVL, AVF, V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6. Now if you want to study the rhythm step, you study the, this one, limb lead 2 from left to right. You scan the entire strip. Now what do you see? There are some abnormalities. For example, these QRS complexes are fairly tall. Number two, QRS complexes are, I think, slightly broad also. Then this PR interval, if you see this one, PR interval looks rather small. Then there are some ST depressions also. So let me show you these in more detail. Now, imagine this one. I think you should focus on this one. If you appreciate this is the P wave and there is hardly any PR interval immediately after P wave with very short PR interval QRS starts and the morphology of QRS is very very different than normal as if some additional wave is added in the initial part of the QRS complex. Let me magnify it and show you. This is the same, I have just cropped a small portion and magnified it. Now see, this is the P wave. There is hardly any PR interval. And then this is additional wave, as if something has been added. Just imagine, normal QRS complex would be like this, starting from here. PR interval going like this, and QRS complex will start from here and go up like this. So as if this wave has been added. That is actually the case. This is called delta wave. This is a pre-excitation syndrome. Now let me go further. It is Wolf-Parkinson White syndrome because it fulfills all the criteria. It has got short PR interval. It has got delta wave. Delta wave in fact is the most important condition and the QRS is broad. Why broad? Because an additional wave, delta wave, has been added to QRS complex. And PR interval is short because that delta wave is actually has taken the space from PR interval. So that is why PR interval is short and QRS is wide. So the QRS is wide as much as uh, the PR interval is short. Both are equivalent because it's actually the same time which is taken by the QRS complex. So these are the 
criteria delta wave which is present in almost all precordial leads almost all limb leads it may be upward like in this case it may be downward depending upon which type of whole parkinson white syndrome you are dealing with so this is upward okay so you have delta waves what is delta wave is an additional wave added to the initial part of the qrs the rest of the qrs is the same and this is there is short pr interval because some part of the Q pr interval is taken up by this delta wave wide qrs complex because this delta wave is added to the qrs complex this is usually wider than normal but not as wide as you expect in ventricular tachycardias or in patient with bundle branch blockers bundle branch blocks and many patients would have history of paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardias for the full diagnosis of whole parkinson white syndrome you need to have both these ecg abnormalities and history of paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardias so i hope this was clear now i'm going to explain the ecg pathogenesis how the ecg abnormality develops now interesting this is the normal one you are familiar with this p wave pr interval qrs st t wave this is when current passes only through the av node but when there is an anomalous pathway like this one the situation is slightly different and now i'm going to show you some animation please follow it closely so that you can understand so like normal current will start from the sa node and will depolarize atria like this one okay i'm doing it step by step so that you understand so current depolarizes there is depolarization of atria and i'm showing only the depolarization phase not the repolarization okay so this is depolarization of atria and this would result in p wave and in pre excitation syndrome p wave is normal because atrial depolarization is normal then current is held in the av node while the current is still held in the av node some current might just leak from this one and it will depolarize a small portion it will be able to depolarize only a small portion of ventricle depending upon where this anomalous path phase is situated in this case it would depolarize this part and if the anomalous path phase is here it would depolarize this part but since this is not the proper conduction system it will only be able to depolarize part of the ventricle and av nodal current after after delay will then enter the conduction system and the rest of the ventricles will be depolarized by the normal conduction so this is the important thing atria are depolarized the normal way only a small portion of ventricle is depolarized to the anomalous pathway that is responsible for delta wave and the rest of the ventricles are depolarized to the normal conduction system why because transmission of current depolarization through the anomalous pathway is slow and av nodal current despite the fact that it was held in the av node for some time it will still reach the ventricles and depolarize before this current can reach the rest of the ventricle so how does this translate into ecg changes see this is a normal p wave because atrial depolarization is not affected then this portion the delta wave is caused by this depolarization through the anomalous pathway as i showed you and that resulted in this delta wave widening the qrs complex and shortening the pr interval and then current reached the ventricle through the av node and rest of the depolarization is exactly the same and the rule says whenever there is abnormality in depolarization there is always abnormality in repolarization so there is st depression uh, not shown here but st depression and t wave inversion so i hope i was able to explain to you how these morphological abnormalities the anomalous pathway results in typical ecg abnormalities if you have difficulty understanding pause 
and rewind the video and I'm sure you will understand. If you still do not understand, do let me know. I may be able to explain to you in some more detail. So uh, the ECG features, these I have covered delta wave that is slur in initial portion of the QRS complex. PR interval is shorter than 120 milliseconds. That is actually uh, three small squares. 0 0.04 into 3 is point, uh, 1 to 3 small squares. QRS prolongation more than 11 and it is less than 12. More than 12 is bundle branch block. It is more than normal. Normal is 10. So it is more than normal but not as much as you expect in bundle branch block. So these are already discussed. But there is ST segment and T wave changes that can lead to misdiagnosis of ischemic heart disease and also hypertrophy pattern. Then pseudo infarction pattern, very important because of these delta wave. If it is upward, it will be recognized as delta wave. But if it is downward, then it would mimic a Q wave. So if it is present in the anterior leads, this Q wave, the pseudo Q wave can be falsely interpreted as anterior wall infarction and if it is in the inferior leads it could cause a confusion of inferior wall infarction. Similarly if the delta wave is upward it would cause an initial R wave like and if it is in the V1 it might give you the impression that this is tall R wave as we see in patient with posterior wall infarction in V1 to V3. So these are I think that makes this condition very important. You could make a wrong diagnosis of myocardial infarction in somebody who does not actually have myocardial infarction. So I think these are the ECG criteria. What is now, I have covered the uh, Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. I'll, I'm going to show you some more ECGs for practice, but let's take up the second condition, Long Genong Levine syndrome. Pathology is anomalous pathway composed of James fiber within the AV node and ECG criteria, PR interval is short, but otherwise ECG is absolutely normal. Now this diagnosis is usually not definite unless patient has history of supraventricular tachycardia. Just short PR interval could be just a normal finding, but you could just label this patient as Lone Genong Levine syndrome if their PR interval is shorter than three small squares. Then Mahem type pre excitation syndrome, the pathology is an anomalous pathway from AV node to the ventricles. ECG would just look normal, normal sinus rhythm. There will be uh, uh, no problem with the PR interval also, but it might result in variation in ventricular morphology. The, the, the QRS morphology may be abnormal and it may result in re entry tachycardia and if there is re-entry tachycardia there may be left bundle branch block pattern because these anomalous pathways are usually present in the anterior part. So uh, going one step further this is mechanism and pattern of paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia in Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. In the previous slide, a slide one and two slides earlier, I explained why the ECG abnormality developed in patient with WPW. But now I'm going to explain how the tachycardia SVT develops. This is the common type called orthodromic. Orthodromic means the anti-grade conduction is through AV node. Anti-grade is from atria to the ventricle like this. This is a V node and if the circuit develops like this, current goes from the atria to the ventricle through the AV node in this direction and comes back through the anomalous pathway. This would be called orthodromic and orthodromic type of SVT. Now this would result in narrow complex SVT. Why narrow complex? Because during tachycardia, current is passing through the AV node this way only. Current is not coming this way. If the current comes from the atria to the ventricle through the anomalous pathway, only then there will be these delta waves. So since current is during tachycardia, current is going coming only this way. 
in the anomalous pathway current is going backward so there will be no delta wave during tachycardia there will be narrow complex svt 85 percent patient would have this type of tachycardia and ecg features of wpw disappear so if you have a patient you need to wait for the tachycardia to disappear then you do the ecg and see if there is abnormality of svt i, I recall many patients where we have done so and in this patient, if you treat this patient with beta blockers or digoxin, I don't see any risk because these drugs, they work on the AV node. So I think you can treat them with these drugs. But the other type, the, this, this drug may be harmful. Now, what is the other type? This is anti -grade. This is called antidromic. You can, I think, remember this. Anti means opposite to normal. Antidromic means that current is going backward through the AV node. See the difference. This arrow indicates the current from the atrium to the ventricle is coming through the anomalous pathway and the backward current is going through the AV node. Now since the current is coming this way through the anomalous pathway, these patients will exhibit delta wave during tachycardia also. So the tachyc since delta waves are present during tachycardia, so the complexes will be broad. Although this is SVT, this is not ventricular tachycardia, although this is supraventricular tachycardia, but the complexes will be broad. And this happens in 15% of the cases. ECG features of WPW are present during tachycardia also, and there is a risk of digoxin. And these patients, the tachycardia may get worse. Actually, they may become faster because AV node would suppress conduction through the AV node. Uh, this digoxin might suppress conduction through the AV node, may somehow promote the tachycardia. Now, what determines that patient will develop this type of tachycardia or this tachycardia? I personally do not know. There may be some factor, but I do know that this is commoner and it is possible that some person may have this type and the same person may have this type also. So if your patient has this type, then I think you need to treat these patients more aggressively because this could become serious. One more slide showing the, some, some interesting uh, animation. I, I really love making these animation and I hope you like it. A lot of effort goes into making these animation, but I really love them. This one, for example, this is the structure of the conduction system. This is atrioventricular reciprocating tachycardia. Now, this is orthodromic. Current comes to, from the atrium to the ventricle to the AV node and goes back to the anomalous pathway. And you can see the ECG is narrow. Complexes are narrow during tachycardia. The delta wave disappears. The complexes are narrow and the heart rate is of course fast because this is SVT. So this is the usual type, 85% of the cases. But in this case, the other type, current comes this way and this is likely to be faster. Although this animation doesn't show, I think I have tried to make this one faster. And the heart rate is faster and the QRS complexes are broader and you can see the delta wave is present there. So these two types of supraventricular tachycardia can occur in patient with Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. This one that on the right one is more serious but luckily less common. Now let's move on. I think I'm now going to show you some slides for practice purposes. This is Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome type A. Right, you can see this is, you see, a short PR interval and delta wave and broad QRS complex. And if this delta wave is upright in V1, now that is what makes it type A. If delta wave is present in, if uh, upward in V1, V2, V3, this is type A. You can see V1 there is a delta wave this actually gives the impression as if this is right bundle branch block but this is actually type a wolf parkinson white syndrome we have hypertrophy pattern also this patient might not have actual hypertrophy but just because of ww patient shows hypertrophy 
there is ST depression, patient might not have ischemic heart disease just because of WPW, there is uh, ST depression, there is some axis deviation, right axis deviation, again patient might not have bundle branch block, but look at this wolf parkinsons white syndrome, it is causing so many ECG abnormalities, so you really need to know this condition to avoid mistakes. So this is one and let's see another one. This is type B. In this you see the delta wave is inverted. See in the V1 it is downward. You could easily confuse this complex as QS complex. And similarly you have QS complex in lead 3 and limb lead 3 and AVF. I think anybody, unless very, very vigilant, anybody can confuse these changes with inferior valve infarction or antiseptic infarction, type B. So type B is very, very difficult and it can actually give rise to false diagnosis and you also see the hypertrophy pattern and ischemic pattern here. So these are two types of Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. This is lone genong levine syndrome and I told you the only ECG abnormality in lone genong levine syndrome is short PR interval, otherwise ECG is absolutely normal. If you see this, this strip, PR interval, if you see this one, and I'm sure you will appreciate the PR interval is very, very short. Now let me magnify it and by using a technique called morph transition, to show it better. See, this is actually magnified portion. You see the PR interval is very short. Of course, you measure PR interval from the start of P wave to the start of QRS complex. But as far as the distance between P and QRS is concerned, there is hardly any. So, this is definitely lone genong levine syndrome because QRS is not wide. There is no delta wave. Okay, so this is the difference. No delta waves and QRS is not wide. Just short PR interval. This is lone genong levine syndrome. Importance, this can cause SVT. I hope this one is also clear. The third one is Mahem Fiber Tachycardia. I just found this ECG uh, from the internet. Uh, frankly, I have never diagnosed Mahem Fiber Tachycardia. I understand this is rare, but just for the sake of completion, I uh, found this uh, ECG. This is Tachycardia uh, and uh, it is a Mahem type of uh, defect. Now, these patients, they actually require electrophysiological studies to diagnose which defect and which is the exact anatomical location of these defects. So thank you very much. Uh, most of these patients they would present with tachycardia and tachycardia should be treated as discussed in the last module and you must know that these ECGs can confuse with other many conditions those patients who have frequent attacks, they should undergo electrophysiological studies and they should undergo um, radio frequency ablation. I think with that, I would like to conclude this module. I hope it was useful, little lengthy, but I think it was interesting. This is Professor Azizur Rahman from Medistan, Understanding Medicine. I love these videos. I hope you also love them and you find them useful. And I really look forward to see you in my next video. Thank you.